This is a message that uh, to get to the passage that I'm going to preach on uh, this morning, I, I want to get a little bit of a springboard, a little bit of a, a running start, because I think it'll mean more to you if I give you a little bit of the background. And I, I am a firm believer that when you preach, you need to keep the passage in context. All right? And uh, so I want to give you the context behind what I'm going to be preaching on a little later this morning, because I think it'll help you a lot. Uh, the year is 586 B.C. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, he invades and attacks the city of Jerusalem. He has already attacked the southern kingdom of Judah, the other cities, and the city of Jerusalem is the last one left. Okay, He's already defeated all the rest of them. And so he comes to the city of Jerusalem with his forces, and uh, that particular account is given to us in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 18 through 23, which I want to read this morning. 2 Chronicles 36, 18 to 23. He, Nebuchadnezzar, carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the kings, and the king and his officials. Now listen to this. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar has leveled the city of Jerusalem. Everything is now rubble and ruins, okay? Um, it says in verse 20, He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. This is what began the Babylonian captivity, which lasted for 70 years. It was God's punishment upon his people for two things, their immorality and their idolatry, okay? That's what the 70 years of captivity was a punishment for. And as it says in verse 20, Nebuchadnezzar took the people captive. Now, what's a little bit kind of hard to believe, he took them captive 900 miles away to Babylon. Think about that. This was not like Babylon was a neighboring nation to the city of Jerusalem. They're 900 miles away, all right? And he took the people captive back there. Um, when you think that Jesus Christ never traveled more than 200 miles from where he was born, I mean, think about it. Let's, let's put this in perspective. He never traveled 200 miles away from where he was born. And these people are held captive and sent into exile 900 miles away. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. It goes on, and it says in verse 21, The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the one who prophesied that the Babylonian captivity would specifically last for 70 years. Okay? Now, listen to this next one. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah... The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Whenever you hear Persia in the Bible, think Iran, modern-day Iran. Okay, that's what we're looking at. 
to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Does that sound kind of strange to you? This is a pagan Persian king saying God wants me to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem 900 miles away. Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Cyrus gives them authorization. He gives them permission to return to Jerusalem. And by the way, he gives them a lot of financial resources to make the trip and to rebuild the temple. Now, if you think that's pretty amazing, let me tell you something else that's even more amazing. Back in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, and also Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, Cyrus is specifically named, he's called, God calls him, my servant. It was prophesied that Cyrus was going to be the one who was going to let the the Jews go back home after 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Now here's what's even more amazing. Cyrus is named twice in the book of Isaiah, 200 years before Cyrus is even born. I mean, think about that. It doesn't say the king of Persia is going to be the one that will allow you to return home after 70 years. It says Cyrus. There are people that don't believe the word of God. All right, sometimes I, I don't get that. The reason they don't believe it is because they haven't spent enough time in it. You know what I found? The more time you spend in the Word of God, the more you believe the Bible is credible and trustworthy. It's, it's funny how that works. It's funny how it works. Some Bible historians refer to this uh, going back home of the Jews as the second exodus. We, we know there was the exodus out of Egypt, after 430 years of being slaves there. Now, this one, the second Exodus. Now, what gets a little confusing, and I hope I can make this simple and easy to understand. A lot of people don't understand that there were three returns from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Three separate returns. Okay, this is where you can get confused a little bit. Uh, the first one was under a man named Zerubbabel. All right, Zerubbabel. He would later go on, he was a tremendous leader. He would later go on to be a governor of Persia. Okay, but he, he uh, was given permission by Cyrus, the Persian king to lead a, a delegation from Babylon to go back to Jerusalem. And he did. 50,000 Jews went back to Jerusalem. All right. Many of the Jews who had been taken captive did not go back. They stayed in Babylon. They had settled in Babylon. They stayed in Babylon. But 50,000 went back with Zerubbabel, in spite of tremendous opposition that came from the Samaritans, they were able to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. It 
only took them 23 years. Twenty-three years to rebuild the temple. That I don't know about you, but that seems like an awful long building project to me. Twenty-three years, but they got the job done. They now had a temple. All right. And sometimes that temple is even referred to as Zerubbabel's temple. Maybe you've heard it referred to that way. Then we have. In Ezra chapter 6, verse 15 and, and to 18, it, it does, it talks about that 23-year period. That's the first, we'll call them Company A, that went back. Company B was about 80 years later, okay, about 80 years later, that company was given authorization by King Artaxerxes I. Now, you're going to be surprised who Artaxerxes I is in just a moment. But that group was given authorization to go back the second time. That group was led, Company B was led by Ezra. Ezra. Okay. Artaxerxes I gave Ezra and that group a chance to go back to Jerusalem. 80 years after Zerubbabel's group returned. Artaxerxes I is the son of a man named Ahasuerus, who was king. Does that name sound familiar? Ahasuerus was Esther's husband. So Artaxerxes I, who gave Ezra and this group of about uh, 1,500 men, not counting women and children, much smaller group, went, was second to return to Jerusalem. He gave them authorization. He would have been Esther's stepson. Okay, now, now let's, let's put this together. Why do you think Artaxerxes I was so sympathetic to the Jews? Because his stepmother was a Jew. He had a special place in his heart for the Jews, and he went way out of his way. And Ezra and his group, their job was to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and the gates. Okay? That's what they were supposed to be doing. They had all kinds of opposition, okay, and persecution. And they didn't get the job done, okay, until Company C showed up. The third group, who came back 13 years after Ezra, they also were allowed, given authorization by Artaxerxes, to go back to Jerusalem after 13 years, and this company, Company C, was led by Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king, who would go on to become the governor of Jerusalem. So two of these leaders that led people back to return to Jerusalem were governors. We don't know how many people Nehemiah returned with. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We have no idea. Um, as we think in terms of the book of Esther, as we talked about Artaxerxes being the stepson of Esther, the events in the book of Esther occur between the first return by Zerubbabel and the second return by Ezra. That's the book of Esther right in there. Okay? These books are out of order chronologically. Esther should be first, then you'd have Ezra, then you'd have Nehemiah, if that helps you understand the, the events better. Okay? Now, 
as I said, their goal was to rebuild the walls and put up the gates around the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16 say this. So the wall was completed in 52 days. When Nehemiah and Company C showed up, that wall that hadn't been built in 13 years from Ezra being there was now completed. And it says, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. It wasn't all dependent upon God because we know in verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 of Nehemiah, it says the people worked with all their heart to build that wall. You see, what had not been accomplished in 94 years was accomplished in 52 days because the people worked with all of their heart and God helped them with their building. All right, that's an incredible, incredible thing. Now, why do I say all of that? Because what I want to preach from this morning is Nehemiah chapter 8, if you want to go there, but I'm going to... Go back into uh, Ezra chapter 7 a little bit here. But uh, Nehemiah 8 tells us what happened one week after the walls were completed. All right. They've gone through all kinds of stuff. To rebuild the temple, there was opposition, there was persecution. To rebuild the walls, hard, hard situation. They've gone through all of this junk. And now the temple's built, the walls are rebuilt, and they've got the gates up. For the first time in 94 years, they have protection around the city, but even more specifically, they have protection around their temple. All right. And we're one week after the completion of the rebuilding of the walls and putting up the gates around the city of Jerusalem. Exodus, or excuse me, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 says, When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. Now, when we think of water gate, we think of something else. Uh, this is a good water gate. All right. They told Ezra the scribe. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about Ezra. He led that second return. All right. Now, we haven't heard anything about Ezra for 13 years. And now Ezra re-enters the narrative here. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. The book of the law of Moses would have been the word, sometimes it's the Pentateuch, meaning the first five books of the Old Testament. Sometimes it's referred to as the law, the Torah. Uh, first five books. Bring that out. Why did they choose Ezra? Well, when you study the book of Ezra, you would have found it would have been foolish for them to choose anybody else. Because in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6, this is what it says. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given the king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. That is a phrase that appears six times in the book of Ezra. The hand of the Lord his God was upon him. He was a student of the scriptures, well-versed, well-versed. 
Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10 says, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. What had he been doing for the last 13 years? He'd been studying the word of God. He had been obeying and practicing the word of God. And he had been instructing and teaching people in the word of God. That's what he'd been doing for the last 13 years. You get to verse 12. There's a, a letter of permission and authorization that had been given to Ezra by King Artaxerxes to allow him to make that second return back to Jerusalem. This is what Artaxerxes says. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest. Ezra was a priest. He was a direct descendant from Aaron, the first high priest. He could trace his genealogy back to Aaron. To Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law of the God of heaven. That's the testimony that this pagan king said of Ezra. He was a priest. We will find out later he was also a scribe. All right. Everybody knew Ezra as a man of the word. So when the people begin to hunger for the word of God, they say, bring us the book. And Nehemiah says, Ezra, you're the one to do this. Do people see you as people of the book? People of the word of God, do people see you like that? Verse 2, so on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. That would be children who could understand. All right, no babies here, no toddlers, no infants. Only those were present who could understand the reading of the word of God. All right. Ezra read it aloud from daybreak till noon. Folks, that's six hours. I wonder how many would stay here this morning. If I started reading the Word of God for six hours. I, mean, I, I, just, I just want you to grasp what's going on here. <clears throat> you see, Nehemiah 8 records for us the first revival in the Bible. And it comes about because someone begins to read the word of God. Six hours. If you look at the end of verse 3, and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. For six hours. They listened attentively. But this did not just happen for one day. If you go to verse 18 of Nehemiah chapter 8, this went on for seven straight days. He would read from daybreak till noon for seven straight days. And people would listen attentively. I, 
I believe there are a lot of people that will be attending churches today all around the world that would consider it a good sermon if it was short. The best sermons are short sermons. To some, the the length of the sermon is the strength of the sermon if it's short. Six hours a day for seven days. Now, where I come from, I'm not real good at math, but that's 42 hours a week of Bible reading, and the people listened attentively. How attentive are you to the reading and the preaching of the Word of God? You see, I believe that attitude and appetite will take us a long way down the road on our spiritual journey. Our attitude and our appetite. Now let me share something with you. I'm 62 years old. I have never had anyone come up to me and complain about a basketball game that they went to that went into overtime. In the NCAA tournament, by the way, going into last night's late games, which that's, I'm a morning person, that's way past my bedtime. There had already been five overtimes in the NCAA tournament. And those fans think that's great because they get their money worth. But when we go to church, many people, the shorter the sermon, the better. They even have a term now. Pastors preaching sermonettes. Sermonettes. I'm talking about six hours. One day for seven days, listening attentively to the Word of God. Do you realize when clocks were first invented, Churches were purchasing the largest cho- the clocks that were invented, and they were putting them on the walls outside the church building to remind people to come and worship. It's time to come and worship. And then somebody thought it was a good idea to take the clocks that were outside the church and start bringing them inside the church to remind people when it was time to go home. I'm telling you, folks, we don't get it. We are so dictated by the clock and schedules that in many cases, I don't even know if the Holy Spirit could move among us because we've got everything so dictated and controlled. And it doesn't help. We've got a second service, so you've got to be done by a certain time to get ready for the second one. You know, we're locked in. Some churches have three and four services. Locked in, locked in, locked in. And then we say, well, I wonder why we just don't have revival in our country. I don't think we have time for revival. We don't have time for it. How would we schedule it in? Derek Kidner is a tremendous Old Testament Hebrew language scholar. He says this, This day was to prove a turning point. From now on, the Jews would be predominantly a people of the book. Right here. Turned it all around. Turning point. Turning point. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Now, they built a stage, a platform for the reading of the Word of God. We build stages today for bands. For 
of the Word of God, there was so much respect. You know, if you go back and you look at some of, uh, some of the, the history of the church, if you go back to like the 18th century, where you had John Wesley, uh, 18th century, one of the great leaders of the Methodist church, he preached for 50 years. He preached over 40,000 sermons. He preached to audiences that were 20,000 people or more without the assistance of any public address system, meaning no microphone. Ezra. We know that there were at least 50,000 people that came back in the first one. This could have been a group in the large thousands. And Ezra stands on that stage. And he reads, he just gets up there with his scroll. His scroll. Now keep in mind, scrolls were extremely, scrolls of the Bible were extremely expensive. The common person couldn't afford them. There would only be one or two people that could afford those things. And they, you know, that's why they said, bring us the book. We don't have it ourselves. We got one copy somewhere, this scroll. Bring it out here and read it to us because we hunger for the word of God. And then you have in uh, verse 5 or verse 4, you have a bunch of names of guys. And uh, these, there's six men on... Ezra's right hand, there's seven men that stood on uh, Ezra's left hand. Usually it's believed that they were leaders representing the tribes. They're all named there. I'm not going to go over all those names. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Standing up was a, a sign of Respect and reverence for the Word of God. Uh, one of my associate pastors, Pastor Bob Smith, I'll never forget whenever I would give him a chance to preach at Harvester, whenever he read Scripture, he would say, out of respect for the Word of God, would you please stand? You see, you, you stand for things or people that you respect. The President of the United States comes into a room, what happens? Everybody stands. A judge comes into the courtroom. What happens? The bailiff says, all rise. All rise. I believe that these people stood for six hours while Ezra read the Bible to them. Some of you think it's a little long to stand with the four or five songs in the worship team. Why do I say that? Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. It says, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They were still standing. You get to verse 7, there's 13 more men that are mentioned. It's the Levites. Um, and there's probably some teaching priests that are involved in that group there. There's something I want to point out that I think is very key in this passage to understanding it. In verse 2, it talks about all who were able to understand. All right? Key point. All who were able to understand. In verse 3, it talks about men, women, and others who could understand. In verse 8, so that the people could understand what was being read. In verse 9, it talks about those, the Levites, who were instructing the people. In verse 12, it says, they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They understood. There's this idea of, 
the whole concept here is that the people wouldn't just hear the word of God, but they would understand what was being read. Now, why was that a problem? Why is there such an emphasis here on the people understanding the, the word as it was being read? Well, they had been in Babylon. Many of these people had been born in Babylon. Not Jerusalem. They spoke Hebrew in Jerusalem. That was the native tongue for the Jewish people. But after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, the, the Hebrew language had become almost extinct. The language that they spoke in Babylon was Aramaic. All right. So when they came back from Babylon to Jerusalem, the, the priest and uh, Ezra was using a scroll that was written in Hebrew, but they didn't all speak Hebrew. So you had to have people going out among the crowd instructing them so that they could understand what was being there was a language barrier, you see. As I said earlier in this message, this is the first recorded revival in the Bible. Some of you might ask, well, how long did it last, Pastor Dave? Not very long, unfortunately. I think of Billy Sunday, the, the great evangelist out of the Winona Lake area in Indiana. Some of you have probably been at the Billy Sunday Tabernacle. Maybe some of you have seen that. Billy Sunday, the former professional baseball player turned evangelist. And nobody preached like Billy Sunday. If you've ever read any of his sermons, they're, they're amazing. Billy Sunday was once asked, if revivals lasted, he replied, no. Neither does a bath, but it's good to have one occasionally. <laughs> revivals involve people. We're fickle. Some of you remember how after 9-1-1, people were going to church like crazy for two weeks. That's what the, all the attendance figures showed. It lasted for about two weeks. This was a really difficult message for me to conclude. So I'm going to read to you what I wrote here to conclude this message. From time to time in the history of the church, God's Spirit has burdened people to pray, search the scriptures, and confess their sins. From these things, He has seen fit to bring fresh life to His people. It happened in Nehemiah's day, and it can happen again in our day. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for speaking first to me this week so that I could speak to my people. Lord, we have so many things in this world that distract us from what are, what's important. We can look at this group and say, how in the world could they give 42 hours a week to just listen to the reading of the Word of God? Didn't they work? Well, they didn't have TV. They didn't have computers. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have these things, Lord, that can become distractions if they're taken to excess.
So Lord, I pray that you will help each one of us with our own spiritual attitude and appetite. May we thirst for the word of God like the deer thirst for water. May we hunger and thirst after righteousness. May we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that all these other things, all these other things are going to be added to us. Help us not just to pray for revival or talk about revival, but help us, Father, to be willing to pay the price for revival. Anything short of that is hypocrisy, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed.